Hi everybody and thanks for viewing this YouTube fly tying tutorial. In my hand I have a peacock eye. This is something that's really special in the fly tying world, mainly because there's so many uses for this. We have peacock hurl along the sides which are used in so many uh, dry and wet flies. We also have the peacock eye which can be stripped and used for the quill gordon. This is just a wonderful feather and if you're a beginning fly tire you probably think wow that sounds pretty simple. However, whenever you start to look into it you realize there's so many variations of just that. For instance, you can get a dyed one. This is one that's dyed red. If you do a Google search, hundreds will come up. My father-in-law is getting into fly tying right now and just him asking me questions about threads have made me realize that there's really a lot to this game. So whenever I look through my own collection of peacock dubbing, I found just a variety in itself. For instance, I have this prism peacock dubbing made by SLF, really shiny, bright, kind of going in that same avenue, we have one from Hairline. This is Ice Dub, again, peacock colored. Getting a little less bright, I have one from Performance Flies. This is their artificial bronze peacock dubbing. And then finally, one that's got just a little bit of shine in it is a model nymph blend by Spirit River, River, again, peacock dubbing. So looking at just these dubbings alone really tells me and probably tells all of you that there's lots of choices out there for the discriminating fly tire. What I'm going to do in this video is go through each of these dubbings, tie them onto a hook, have you look at them on that hook, and also show you some nice methods and some effective methods of placing them on the hook. And then most importantly, I'm going to wet them with water so you can see exactly what happens to these colors when those flies are wet. So I'm going to get everything reset right now and go through tying all these different peacock dubbings on this hook, and then I'm going to finish with some natural peacock just so you can see the difference. Okay, the first dubbing I'm going to use is Prism by SLF. This is a really nice green colored, very shiny peacock dubbing. Whenever I pull a pinch of this from the, um, from the packet, you can see it's a really loose dubbing and it's extremely shiny. For starters, whenever I see shiny dubbing like this, that's typically dubbing that I'll use either for the body or for the head on flies that have a lot of weight. Those, we're talking bead heads, tungsten, lead, just stuff that's going to get to the bottom of the water column. And once it gets there, no matter how deep it is, if there's any light penetrating, it's going to reflect off of this material and hopefully capture the attention of a trout or I guess a grayling. So um, let me just kind of explain how I would, I would place dubbing that loose on a nymph. I just have a little ADOT black thread here. Even though it is that loose, and by loose I mean just kind of open, you can just dub this with a typical dubbing noodle. Let me get that zoomed out a little bit. And by dubbing noodle I mean just to grab a little bit of it. Make the noodle around your thread. And wrap forwards or backwards, whichever direction you're going to be heading. And you can see that for the most part it makes a relatively tight body. Um, and and it really looks just the way that it should. On my patterns where I use this, I will also typically finish it with a piece of Velcro just so I can pull those fibers out a little bit for a couple reasons. Maybe I want them to look like legs or maybe I just want some translucency around the pattern. That's something that, you, that can be gained by just picking it out with a bodkin or some Velcro. Now there's a second technique that I would use whenever I have dubbing this loop. I'm just gonna backtrack just a little bit so pretend like that, that dubbing is not there already. And I'm going to grab some wax. This is just some Orvis um, premium dubbing wax. There's all other brands out there. I'm just going to take the wax and just apply a little bit down my thread. Now the method I'm, that I'm going to be using here is called touch dub. And it's simple because I place the wax on, then I take this material that's really loose, and I just touch it to the thread. And because I've waxed the thread, this material will stick to it. And now if you look at them, let me zoom out just a hair, you can see how this material is just kind of going all over the place. It's really loose, it's really open, yet it's still adhering to the thread. Now when I wind this material on, and I have a little overlap here because I didn't apply dubbing at the front, I'm just going to wind it forward and I can pull it back if I'd like as I wind it forward but it's a little bit of a looser body and that translucency is already built in. So I don't have to pick it away with my Velcro. So that's the second method that I would employ whenever I have materials that are that loose. Um, 
is one better than the other? I wouldn't say yes or no either way. I think there's just different materials and different methods for creating that look that you're going for. I like that real translucent open look, especially on caddis patterns. Um, I think it really would represent more of an emerger type caddis and it might be a key for trout. I love picking it away, especially whenever it's at the head uh, of the fly, whenever I'm using Velcro in the Velcro. In the thorax and the head, I really like using Velcro just to give it that, just a little bit more of a buggy look. Now finally, um, as I mentioned earlier, the one thing you really got to do whenever you have so many different dubbings is take that finished fly and just place it in some water and see what it looks like when it's wet. So I just keep a little bit of water next to my vise and this is what it looks like when it's wet. Now there's a lot of extra fibers, I'm just going to pick those out and you can see that this thing just screams bugginess. It's just got so much stuff going on. It's extremely translucent. It just looks like it's almost a living uh, living fly right now, just by adding a little bit of water. So that's what the Prism SLF looks like. Let me get everything reset up here and I'm gonna move on to my second type of dubbing. All right, let's take a look at the second peacock color dubbing that I have for us and it's Ice Dub and it's made by Hairline. When you take a look at the coloration of this one, even though, it, again, it is peacock, it's a little bit more of a darker color than that SLF prism dubbing. When I pull it out, however, it still has that kind of openness. It's not a really compact dubbing. It's longer fibers. There's still quite a bit of translucency. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to place this one on my hook. And for starters, I'm going to say if you want to stick with a typical um, dubbing noodle, you can go with that. If you would like to touch dub it, this is another one that I would touch dub. Something else that's neat to do whenever you have material that's this open is to create a dubbing loop. To create a dubbing loop, I'm just going to grab a little tool. This is a tool by um, Stonfo. It's an Italian-based company. They have a couple prongs on this. And what that does is it helps to create a little loop in your thread. So I'll, I'll zoom out so you can kind of see what I'm doing here. I, I'm going to take this tool and capture the thread with this tool. So you can see the tool's just basically hanging by it. Then I'm going to double up my thread, or at least try to. And I've created just a little loop. Now what's nice about this is that I can pull that loop closed, and then I can spin this. And whenever I spin it, it's going to trap all those fibers and really do some really cool stuff with them. So let me grab the fibers. I'm going to place them inside this loop. And you have to determine exactly how many you want in there and for what purpose. So I'm placing quite a bit in here. This is not the amount that I would place in this type of a loop if I was actually building up a body. That would be a little bit too much and I don't like how these fibers are so long. That's not what, how I would build up a body. But I would put them in there if I was building up the thorax or the head because that can kind of give the impression of legs. Now watch what happens whenever I spin this. And this is a really cool uh, tool that Stonfo makes. It captures all of them, it gets them nice and tight. You can spin it really crazy. And it almost looks like it creates a chenille with these. It happens so quick, you can do it in a short amount of time. You have to be careful whenever you're making these dubbing loops. The one thing that I've noticed is that you can, you can just keep spinning, keep spinning, believe you're getting it tighter, and then that thread can snap. So kind of keep that in mind. I'm gonna advance my normal thread forward. If you have a rotary, you can just use your rotary vise to, um, to advance everything. I'm just going to wrap this around, and it's basically like wrapping chenille. I'm just going to pull it back a little bit to make sure those fibers are going towards the back of the hook. When I get close to the eye, I'm just going to tie this stuff up. Okay, let me get everything out of here. All right, so now let's take a peek at what we got. I'll zoom in for you. There is just stuff going all over the place. So the first thing I'm going to do is just take everything and pull it forward, try to get all those excess, excess pieces out of the way. Now we're left with this just almost a dark looking buggy nymph that just has all these extra pieces shooting out. It's almost got a built-in translucency. You could kind of interpret those as legs. You can interpret those as a casing or some type of emerging, um, emerging shell for this fly. 
So that's what it looks like whenever you're using this ice tub made by Hairline. Let me show you what it looks like whenever it's wet. Now if you take a peek at this, you can see not much has really changed. It doesn't kind of capture the water like that SLF prism did. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I don't want to say it's good or bad, it's just what it is. What I really am trying to stress with everybody is that the fact that, to recognize the fact that nothing's really changing whenever I'm getting this wet. It didn't really darken up because it was already a dark color, you still have some translucency. So for this Ice Dub Peacock, even though I brought it up the body, that's one that I really would prefer more at the head of a fly because I think it's nice and dark, Represents uh, it could represent a really nice looking caddis head, and it just picks out very well, but maintains just a little bit of brightness, so if you are fishing this a little deeper, that still is going to be capturing uh, any light that's at the bottom of the water column. All right, so I'm gonna reset everything, get all this stuff out of here, and then move on to our third dubbing. All right, the third dubbing that we're gonna use is simply called Peacock Dubbing. This stuff is out of the Czech Republic by Simon, S-I-M-A-N dot C-Z. The color is Peacock Bronze. So there will be a little bit more of a bronze tint in this dubbing than the previous two that I've shown you. I got this from Performance Flies uh, from Kevin Compton over there. Um, it's a really nice looking dubbing. dubbing. Whenever I pull it out, you'll see that it's definitely not as loose as those previous two. There's a lot more going on. It seems like there's a, a little bit more of a, even though it's artificial, it almost looks like there's some other stuff mixed in with all that peacock colored shine. So keep that in mind with this dubbing. It's a really neat dubbing and, and Kevin actually recommends a couple things with it. In fact, I've actually used this in a previous video. I'll put a link on the YouTube, um, this right now. So you, if you'd like to see how it was used in a previous video, you can, and I'm going to show something very similar this time. Like the previous two, um, I would definitely shoot for a um, just the typical dubbing noodle you, you can use with this one. And I would encourage you to, to use this for the body for flies such as the granum. You can also use a, um, a touch dub method. There is enough bulk there and it is light enough that you could go touch dubbing. Though Kevin represents making a dubbing loop with this stuff and using it for the head of the fly. Here's a little dubbing tool that uh, he sells through Performance Flies. This is a really slick one as well. Being that you advance your thread up, and this hangs from your thread. I'm just going to um, extend my thread just a little bit and make my loop. So I have that nice big loop there. I'm gonna move my, my thread forward, and in this loop I'm going to place some of this peacock dubbing. So I'm gonna place this in here, get it bunched up near the front. I don't need a lot. And then this is the nice thing about Kevin's tool. I'm gonna hang my, put my finger here and let that hang and I'll, I'll zoom out so you can see this. And what Kevin has really stressed with me is that you can ex just go crazy with this stuff and just let it spin. And I'm gonna really torque it up. So I'm just gonna spin that thing and it's gonna go and you're gonna start to see all this dubbing up here just get captured. And it really just makes a nice uh, we'll say a nice thread base so that you can wrap this on again kind of like chenille. If you have a rotary vise like I do, you can simply wrap it forward that way. Since I know not everybody does, I'm just going to simply wrap this forward and I'll show you what type of um, head this would make on a, on a fly. Now as I wrap this one forward, I again just like I did in the previous with the previous dubbing, I like to pull back so those fibers can just really head towards the back of the fly because that's where they're intended to go anyway. Lock this in place. And get it out of there. Okay, so this is the look that you'll get from this peacock dubbing through performance flies. It's a little bit darker. This is the bronze tint, so keep that in mind. But whenever I put it in that dubbing loop, again, just like that previous one, it really has those nice legs or that nice buggy section that's shooting out. But then something different that you should see going on in this case is the fact that underneath, there is a lot of texture. It's a thicker dubbing, and you can basically see that head or that the body of the fly underneath that. 
So that really um, does separate this dubbing from the other two. And again, it's not any better or any worse. It's just what it is. Most importantly, let's get it wet and see what it looks like. So we knew that SLF Prism, it really just took on a bugginess. The previous one uh, by Hairline, it didn't change too much. And this performance is kind of right in the middle of the two, this Peacock dubbing. It definitely gets that bugginess going on. Um, you can still see a lot of the shine. You can still see some of that underbody texture. And it just really gives this fly a nice look. Now again, this is only for the head. I only tied this into the head. And in fact, some of these might be a little long, so I'd probably pull them forward, just pick them out of there with my fingers, and then, and then stroke them back again. So that was my third dubbing. This was just a peacock dubbing, um, the peacock bronze color that you can get through performance flies. Let me get everything reset, and I'll show you a fourth type of peacock dubbing. Okay, the fourth type of dubbing that I'm going to share with you is a Mottled Nymph blend. This is by Spirit River. Again, the color is peacock. Hopefully you're starting to realize that not all peacock dubbings are created equal. Whenever I grab a pinch of this one out of the packet, the first thing I notice is that there's a bunch of different colors kind of blended together. So it does, does give that kind of iridescence that you will see on natural peacock. A couple things that I noticed is that it's not as loose as those first two dubbings that I used, but there's really also not as much shine. Is that better or worse? It's not really anything. It's just, again, what it is. Whenever I see dubbing like this, this is dubbing that I typically will just use with a dubbing noodle. However, I do like a little bit of shine, and this is a good instance where you can say, all right, we have this dubbing. Let's um, experiment with some different types of ribbings for it. So I've placed three different ribbings on the hook. As an FYI, I never really, never ever use three ribbings on a hook. I'm just doing that so you can kind of see the difference between uh, these ribbings and this material. The ribs that I've placed on here, I have a uh, an oval French tinsel. I'll just zoom in so you can see this. Looks like that. I have a normal mylar tinsel, it's gold on one side, silver on the other, and I prefer that silver look whenever I'm using Peacock. And then finally I have just a very thin uh, Danville fine wire, silver wire. So three very distinct wires. I shouldn't say wires, three very distinct ribbing materials. I'm just going to pick this stuff apart, that I'm now back to my dubbing, just create a really fine dubbing noodle. Dub this onto my hook, just all kinds of different colors coming off of the thread. Let's see what this looks like when we wind it forward. You can see it's just taken on all kinds of different colorations. So now I'm up by the eye. Now let's um, kind of see what this dubbing looks like whenever we wrap some of our, um, our ribbings forward. The first one I'm going to rib forward is this oval tinsel. I really like this tinsel. I use this a lot on Prince Nymphs. And you can see with that tinsel wrap forward, you can see the tinsel. I'll zoom in just a little bit so I'm sure that you can see that. Um, but the body does shine through. Now, I don't want to pick this apart until we have all of them done, but you, I just really want you to stress and see that that tinsel, I'm sorry, this ribbing does shine through. It gives a really nice shine off of these lights that I have here for my fly tying room. And it also just provides some nice coloration with the body. I'm going to unwind that one. Hopefully, I'll just leave it hang. The next one I'm going to um, rib with is just the silver mylar tinsel. And unless I really space this one out apart, it's almost too wide for this type of material. There's very little material showing through unless you really want that extra shine. Now, if I ever would use this material, this um, tinsel with that type of dubbing, it would be only in a, a case where I'm fishing it really deep. I probably would have a tungsten bead, maybe some type of lead on the body as well to get that fly down deep. And there's a lot of shine. And I would undoubtedly pick out that, that, um, Oh, I'm sorry, pick out some of that dubbing so that it really kind of looks almost like legs or gills such as on an Isonychia. All right, then finally, let me unwind that. At least attempt to. Well, 
looks like some of this material is grabbing it already. Must have happened whenever I, oops, there goes my thread. All right, then the final one will be this fine wire. Now this is more of a traditional uh, wire that you would use for ribbing. As I wrap this forward, I can tell you that it pretty much has disappeared in this dubbing. Is it keeping it together? Sure. On my side of the hook, I can kind of see it shining through, but for the most part, it has absolutely disappeared. Now, is that a bad thing or a good thing? What I'll tell you is that whenever you have a, a wire like that that just disappears, what that does is it will at least keep the a lot of the dubbing close and tight to the body. So if you want that strong body profile, like was in the that like we showed in the third peacock dubbing, that had a nice body profile and it still had some of the fibers picked out. That's something that this would do by using a, a wire like this. The wire is not really going to be used as something as an attractant that you can see that shine and the fish are going to see it and say, oh, look at that going on. Instead, they're going to you're going to be using it to really hold the body in place. And then you could take your Velcro or your um, uh, a needle and pick out the rest of that dubbing. Now, in this case, I am going to do that. I'm just going to leave this wire in here. Since I lost my thread, I think that will hold everything in place for us. So let me just keep get everything else out of here, pick those out. So I have that wire holding everything together. It's not really being used as necessarily a ribbing or for shine. Just gonna take some Velcro, pick some of this material out, pull it back. You can see when I pick it out, it really comes out just a little bit um, frizzy, kind of goes all over the place. And when I first look at that, I'm not really a huge fan of my flies getting that frizzy like that because it, it doesn't necessarily look buggy to me yet. So I'm going to place it in the water and see what happens. Okay, I got this one nice and wet. Now it has taken on a little bit more of that buggy look that I like. You can see how everything just kind of sticks to itself. I don't see that, that that shell or that encasement that I do like to see in some of these patterns, but it definitely has changed the profile of that, that um, dubbing material. It's gotten a little bit darker. Um, the ribbing will actually start to shine through now that it's wet. So that's a, a good thing now that I, can, I notice that. So if I do decide to use a fine wire with this type of material, it will shine through. All right, so that was my fourth dubbing. That was the Spirit River Modeled Nymph Blend. Again, a peacock color. What I'm going to do on this last one, I'm going to use two different shades of peacock, show you what real peacock looks like, just in the event that you haven't used it or maybe you don't see it wet too often. And then um, I'll finish up this video. Okay, finally, we're going to look at some natural peacock. Well, for starters, I really love to use peacock eyes. A uh, number of different reasons. There's a lot of flexibility. There's a lot of stuff that you can do with these, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video. But also, it seems like whenever you get a peacock eye, and this one, this is one that I cut in half, uh, just for storage purposes, a lot of the hurl on the eye just appears to be better quality hurl. Is it necessarily that much better than the hurl that you'll buy whenever you buy a package? Well, that really varies, but I'll be honest, whenever I buy packages of, of peacock hurl, such as this, I really do open the package and look through it and just decide if there is enough you know, high quality peacock in it. It just doesn't seem like that exists as much anymore unless you're buying it off of an eye. Now, I'm gonna use some of this peacock curl in the package just so you can get an idea of uh, some different ways that I use it. But in almost all of my tying applications, whenever I do use peacock off the eye especially, I'll trim off two pieces. I'll trim the tips just so they're even and tied in by the tips. That's how I prefer to tie in peacock. And I also love to go back over peacock with my thread or some type of ribbing material just because it's a very delicate fiber and I wanna ensure that nothing's going to happen to it. So in this case, I'm just gonna grab a couple pieces of peacock out of this package because I, I feel like that's how the majority of tires, that's how they use their peacock. So I might just pull a few out and I'm gonna just look for a few things. I wanna make sure that there is actually some peacock on them. For instance, this one at the tip, there's really not much there. But as you go down further into the base, there's a lot more peacock. So I'm just going to take this one out. I'm going to use this as one of my pieces. But I'm going to immediately just cut off the top because I don't want any of that stuff. There's not a lot of peacock on it, and it would be a waste. In fact, as I start looking down this fiber, there's really not much there. And this is a piece that I'm not going to use. Instead, I'm going to throw that piece away. Go look for a couple other pieces. Here's a nice piece. 
And what I deem is nice is that it has longer fibers and also you get that nice green translucent color or that iridescent green as I move it around. I'm sure you can see that in the video. So I'm just going to go cut the tip off a little bit and look for another piece. Again, I'm looking for that green iridescence. I'm looking for nice longer fibers. Here's another one. I'm holding it by the base. You can tell it's the base because they'll typically be like a little white section or cream colored section. So I'm going to go to the other end and just trim a little bit. I make that trim for a number of reasons. First of all, I, I noticed that in a lot of these, a lot of the tips of this peacock, they're really delicate. And if you tie it in initially by the tip and then start wrapping forward, sometimes you'll have just an immediate breakage. So I just kind of eliminate that. Also, I like to make sure that they're lined up. When I go to tie them in, I don't have anything to worry about. And when I tie them in, I'm just going to tie them into a point where I don't even have to worry about trimming the tips. So I'm just going to wrap them in, advance my thread forward, and now I can dub them forward. Now there's a lot of applications where you would use peacock for the body of a fly. You could use them on a prince nymph. You can use them on a Griffith's gnat, a granum caddis. You can also use them as the head. Now in this case, I'm just going to simply wrap it forward just to give you a look of, or an idea of how peacock will look when wrapped forward. I do have two. I'm going to wrap them both forward at the same time. I'm just going to bring them up to my thread stop. And in this case, I don't have any type of a wire or any type of a ribbing. So in my mind, I really feel that if you plan on catching any amount of fish on a pattern that has peacock and you don't have a wire ribbing, you're, you're really going to be gambling because there's a chance that those, those, the teeth of the fish could, without a doubt, just jeopardize this material. So I'm just going to wrap my thread back and forth and wind back through these. And then I'm going to do the same and wind forward. Now I know a lot of tires, whenever they're tying on bodies of this, they might just take a piece of thread from just an extra spool they have lying around and just tie the piece of thread in at the back and then wrap it forward. I guess counter wrap it based on whatever direction you've already tied in your peacock so that you can protect the peacock. You can use um, a 5X, a 6X tippet if you'd rather go with something clear. Um, for me, it's just a case of I really just like being fast. I want to ensure that I have everything just going in the right direction. I'll wrap it in and then counter wrap my thread back. And whenever we tie off, I'm just going to get that out of there and I'm going to show you what this peacock looks like whenever it's wet. So just a little bit more for you guys. You can see all those fibers have just kind of scrunched up in a sense. Now, is that what I anticipate it looking like when it's wet? Absolutely not. And this is the secret to why Peacock is such a, just a phenomenal material. All those fibers are just kind of collapsing towards the center right now, which should tell you immediately that that means Peacock will basically breathe whenever it's in the water. Whenever this fly is going through the current, all those little fibers will be moving back and forth basically imitating an insect that possibly could be struggling or just breathing or just moving in the water. The other nice thing about it is that as I turn it, you can see the light just reflecting off it in different patterns. Now that's what a lot of um, these dubbing, uh, dubbing suppliers will go through or go for whenever they're, whenever they're creating their dubbings. They want that to look just so there's that iridescence coming off. But this is the natural peacock and you can see that iridescence, especially whenever it's wet. So it's a really nice, buggy looking material. Um, hopefully whenever you're seeing it wet right now, and then you can imagine this floating in the current or drifting in the current, you can really begin to see how, how just special this material is and why it does catch so many fish because it's featured in so many just effective patterns out there. All right, the last thing I'm gonna do is just clean off this hook uh, and I'm gonna finish tying in um, a red peacock. So let me get everything cleaned up here and reset. Okay, the final material I'm going to show you is a dyed red peacock eye. Here's the front, and when you see the back and you look at that stem, you can see how it's really a nice red. Though when you look at the actual hurl on the sides of this eye, they mainly just give off a red hue. There's a couple applications in which I'd use that. For starters, I like to use these ones that are red for the head of coronamids. So some smaller patterns, I really believe that a lot of the, the naturals I'm imitating have some red in them, and by having that red hue in this peacock, it does a really fine job of representing that. 
I also have some purple dyed um, peacock eyes. Are there that many purple flies in the water? I know, I don't think so. But I do know that it seems like whenever I'm fishing for steelhead, especially out of um, Lake Erie, that purple and blue just seems to be a color that sometimes those fish just seem to hit. Not sure exactly why. So at times, whenever I'm tying certain nymphs, such as a prince nymph, I'll um, substitute some purple dyed peacock instead of the natural. All right, so I'm just gonna grab two of these fibers. I'm just gonna pull them off. Again, like I mentioned, in the prior video. I'm just gonna line them up by their tips and snip them so they're both approximately the same length. And then I'm gonna tie them in. Okay, um, and now that I'm thinking back to that last video, I had wrapped them in the same direction as my thread. So I I, I took them around the, um, around the hook clockwise, if you're looking at the hook from the eye facing the back, and then I brought my thread around that same direction. So whenever I did that in that last video, I really was not securing those because my thread was not counter-wrapped. So keep that in mind. Uh, whenever I have a ribbing, I'll counter-wrap the ribbing in the opposite direction that I'm wrapping these peacock. I didn't do that with that thread because that was just an instance. I think I was just rushing or I'm um, not really thinking for this video. So in this case, because I'm just going to be we'll say I'm um, securing them with my thread after I wrap them forward, I'm actually going to counter-wrap them. So I'm going to go the opposite direction of the way that I'm tying my thread, that I'm wrapping my thread. Okay, now to secure everything in place. I'm just going to bring my thread back. I'm just winding it back and forth so I don't lock down the majority of those fibers. Okay, I might wind this forward. Get everything out of here. Okay, so now we have our finished um, peacock. This is with the dyed red. I'm just going to spin it real quick. You can see that the light is reflecting off of it a little bit, not necessarily as much as the natural. And then let me get it in water, and we'll see what it looks like when it's wet. All right, like the natural peacock, you can see all those materials just kind of clumping up in a sense. Clumping is probably not the best word. They're almost collapsing just because they've you know taken on a little bit of the weight of that water, and they're ready to move back and forth. So just like natural, whenever we get this in the water, those materials are going to be waving back and forth. They are going to be moving. Um, they're going to just really be looking like something that's alive in the water, which is why natural peacock is so effective. Um, is there as much iridescence as with the natural? Absolutely not. Is there still some? Yeah, without a doubt. Does it have that encapsulated look um, that you'll get with some of those other dubbings? No, you really don't. But again, you got to really decide up front what you're shooting for. So with that said, I really do appreciate you um, watching this video. I hope um, you gained something from it. Um, the point I was really shooting for was the fact that whenever you go into a store, whenever you order something online and you're saying, hey, I want to either get some natural peacock or I want to get some artificial peacock dubbing, there's really just a wide variety of choices that you have. And each one is without a doubt different. No matter if they, they say they're, they're extremely similar, they can just be different hues, different hints, and they can have a lot of different materials that they're made out of, which could cause them to be extremely loose, really clumped up, or you know, just somewhere in the middle. So please keep that in mind whenever you are purchasing some peacock dubbing in the future, or if you're buying some natural peacock. Take your time with it, um, figure out exactly what you want, and hopefully you can make the right decision for your fishing needs. So with that said, I really do, again, appreciate you viewing this video. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to leave them directly on this YouTube page, or you can email me at tkamisa at gmail.com. Thanks, everybody, for viewing this fly tying tutorial of Peacock and the various dubbings.